Hello, welcome to the third ever online story time for holy troublemakers and unconventional saints. This is an anthology book aimed at middle grade and up, so that's about third grade and up, but of course, younger and older are welcome too. It's full of stories about people from all sorts of faith backgrounds who have worked for love and justice, even when that sometimes upset the religious boat. Um, there's incredible portraits and inspiring stories of uh, all kinds of people who I really admire and I wanted my children to know more about. And some of them are people that you have heard of before and some people you have not, but all have a little something to teach us, um, especially in this moment when we're facing some extra challenges. So today I'm going to read the story of somebody who is really, really been helpful as a teacher to me. This is somebody who I actually know in real life, and we have a little surprise at the end. If you stay tuned, we might get to actually have a little chat with him. So his name is Herb Montgomery, and Herb has been an important person who helped me, especially as I was looking for ways to understand the Easter story. And right now we have Easter coming up in just a couple of days. It's going to be an unusual Easter where there aren't going to be church services or people gathering. It's going to be at home. And uh, Herb has a way of talking about Easter and that story that I find really, really life-giving. And I wanted to share his story with you. If you have the book at home, it starts on page 100. And um, I want to remind everyone that there is a glossary at the back. There's a few terms that come up um, in every chapter, but in Herbs in particular that I think you, if you have it, let's, you might want to use the glossary as you're going through. Ready? Here we go. Oh, and I wanted to point out his portrait. It's a really special one because his daughter, Allie Montgomery, painted it. It's a watercolor. Nine-year-old Herb Montgomery and his mother sit in rapt attention, watching a television show called Praise the Lord, or PTL for short. A popular preacher named Jim Baker hosts the show. Baker interviews Christian celebrities and preaches a very conservative version of evangelical Christianity. Now, I want to pause for one second because that is one of those words that can be really tricky to define, and there's a whole glossary here in the back. There's a lot of different types of Christians. We should actually talk about Christianities. And one of the types of Christian is an evangelical Christian. They're a type of Protestant Christian. That means they aren't Catholic. They came out of the Catholic Church. Uh, Martin Luther, who led the Protestant movement, that was about 500 years ago. It's a very loosely organized group of Christians. They don't have a formal structure like, say, the Episcopal Church or the Catholic Church or Lutherans or some of those other denominations. The name evangelical refers to sharing one's faith with other people or evangelizing. They place a strong emphasis on personal conversion by saying a prayer that's sometimes called the sinner's prayer that invites Jesus into one's heart. In the United States, white evangelicalism has been strongly connected with very conservative politics since the 1980s. So that's the type of show that Herb and his mother are watching that day. The year is 1985, and this show is frequently on in Herb's house. Herb's parents work behind the scenes on the show. His stepdad is a camera operator, and his mother is a makeup artist. His family knows everyone who is part of the show's production, and Herb often plays on the set. Suddenly, Preacher Jim looks directly into the camera and says, The Lord is impressing me that there is a young man today who is home from school and watching this show. That young man is going to grow up to be a mighty missionary for God. Herb's mother turns to look at Herb with wide eyes. Son, he's talking about you, she says. Although Herb isn't so sure, his mother needs no more convincing. From that moment on, in his mother's eyes, Herb is going to be a missionary and a preacher. When PTL ended a few years later in the midst of a scandal that sent the preacher to prison, Herb's mother was devastated. She couldn't believe that preacher Jim Baker had been taking people's donations and misusing them, but there was no doubt that he had been. Herb was a teenager then, and he wanted to have nothing more to do with Christianity. 
But shortly after this, while in his grandmother's attic in West Virginia, Herb came across some Bible studies about the New Testament book of Revelation. The New Testament is the second half of the Bible in Christian Bibles. Christians tend to also use Jewish scriptures or Hebrew scriptures, but Christians call them the Old Testament. But to Jews, there's nothing old about them. They're still their scriptures. And the book of Revelation is a very odd book at the very end that has a lot of vivid imagery that lots of people have tried to interpret and figure out what it means. Very popular to give Revelation seminars or things like that. And people always like to think they have a little special knowledge about what might be coming. And Herb came across some, some of those in his grandmother's attic. These studies painted a vivid picture of a violent end to the world that was coming soon. And this led Herb and his mother to join a very conservative church. Within a few years, Herb became the preacher that his mother had always hoped he would be. Herb traveled all over the world, preaching at churches, school week of prayer meetings, and other religious gatherings. His message was one of God's love and grace, but still he preached within the boundaries of what a conservative church audience expected to hear. He wrote a successful book, and he was in high demand as a visiting speaker. His preaching schedule was booked months and even years in advance. And something didn't feel quite right to Herb. One day in 2012, Herb had an aha moment. Have you ever had one of those? It's where you suddenly have an inspiration or a light bulb goes off. Well, Herb had one of those. And this would dramatically change the message of his teaching. For some time, Herb had been questioning a Christian teaching called atonement. This teaching is based on the belief that God is distant from people because their sins make God angry very angry. Atonement says that in order to calm God's anger down, Jesus had to die on the cross. The people who accept Jesus's death as a payment for their sins can be reconciled to God or at one with. Atonement is at one with God. This is still a very commonly taught belief in many Christian churches today. But Herb's aha moment came because he suddenly realized that this commonly taught idea about atonement was actually violent and harmful. How could a loving God require a violent death? And as long as people believed in a God that required a violent death in order to forgive them, then people were going to feel justified in treating each other with violence too. Herb began reading all that he could it turns out that conversations about the atonement had been going on in Christian circles for hundreds of years, all the way back to the very early Christians. A wide range of Christian beliefs about atonement exist even today. In fact, the man who wrote the few verses of the Christian scriptures that can seem to teach that Jesus had to die on the cross to appease an angry God was Paul, someone who never actually met Jesus. It's a really interesting thing to me that the vast majority of the Christian part of the Bible was written by somebody who never met Jesus. The more Herb learned about a concept called nonviolence, the more his questions about atonement made sense. For Herb, nonviolence is looking at everything through the lens of Jesus' teachings. He says, quote, Christians are Christians because they believe that Jesus is the divine revelation of God. That means that while the words in the Bible can provide guidance, they aren't meant to take the place of Jesus. If something doesn't seem like something that Jesus would say or do, then it needs to be reevaluated. The formal term for this, it's a kind of a fancy term called Christological hermeneutic. And it simply means that you filter everything first through the life and teachings of Jesus. Does a belief or practice measure up to the ideas that Jesus preached in the Sermon on the Mount? Does this idea love our neighbors? Does this idea see God in the least of these? If the answer is no, then maybe we need to re-examine that belief or practice. That's the simple thing of this idea of nonviolence is, does this seem like something Jesus would say or do? Herb began sharing his new understanding about Jesus, God, and nonviolence. He now teaches that Jesus didn't come here to die. He came to show us how to live. I'm going to read that line one more time because that was really profound for me when I first heard this. Herb now teaches that Jesus didn't come here to die. He came to show us how to live. 
It's not the death of Jesus that saves us. It's his teachings. What if Jesus' death wasn't the point? Herb now asks. What if Jesus died not because he had to save us from an angry God, but simply because he stood up to the status quo? Soon, Herb realized that his new understanding of the purpose of Jesus' life and teachings affected his thinking on many other things. He saw how most Christian churches that had hurt LGBTQ people by rejecting them. That is another glossary term uh, in the back. LGBTQ simply stands for lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, or queer. And Herb started to see how the church's teachings had very frequently hurt LGBTQ people. He started to see the ongoing harms from sexism and racism and all of the systems in our society that support sexism and racism. He began to teach about sharing our resources with each other around a shared table, the way that Christian communities had in the early days. It was like pulling the thread of a sweater, Herb remembers. Soon the whole thing had come apart in my hands. All of these new insights came from Herb learning about nonviolence. Learning about nonviolence immediately fell right in the very core of my being, Herb says. I felt like I was returning home after a very long absence. Some people stopped inviting Herb to their churches to speak after he had these insights. Donations to the nonprofit he'd started began to drop off. It was a much harder idea for many people to think that Jesus came to teach us how to live, rather than the old idea that Jesus simply came to die for us. Many people like to believe that we owe God a cosmic debt for our sin, and that to get a ticket to heaven, you just need to say you believe that Jesus' death paid off that debt. There's a difference between a gospel about Jesus and the gospel Jesus himself taught, Herb says. Jesus' teaching about loving our enemies and loving our neighbors is a lot more challenging for people. Following Jesus' example and teachings is actually much harder than simply believing that he died for our sins. Following Jesus' teachings today might mean changing how we treat those who are at the margins of our society, refugees, immigrants, LGBTQ people, disabled people, indigenous people, and people of color. And that is a lot more work. Jesus was interested in the liberation of all people in the here and now, Herb says. Liberation means setting free, to liberate. So Herb says Jesus was interest, interested in the liberation of all people in the here and now. That means we can participate in working to heal our present world making it a just, safe, and compassionate home for everybody. The prompt on this one is a really profound one to me. How might you view Jesus differently if you thought he came to show us how to live instead of simply coming to die? That's a really big question, and it's something that a lot of... <laughs> The adults in your life haven't figured out yet either. It was many, many years of me trying to think about some of these questions before I came across some of Herb's lectures and podcasts and um, realized that there were other ways to think about the story of Jesus and the story of Easter other than just Jesus had to die for our sins. When my oldest daughter was just three years old, we were at a church service, and I didn't even think she was paying attention. She was coloring something and not even sitting in the pew. She was um, eating a few snacks. But the sermon was all about how our hearts were broken and full of badness. Um, but the good news was supposed to be that Jesus had died and we could accept his heart instead of ours. And a little bit later that afternoon, my three-year-old asked if she was going to die. And I said, what in the world, where are you getting this from? And finally, we realized that there had been um, a baby in our family, um, not our immediate family, but in the extended family, who had very sadly not lived for very long for a few different reasons, but the reason that she could understand when she was three was because her heart didn't work. And my little three-year-old girl had heard that our hearts were broken in church that day. And I realized that she was 
growing up with the idea that there was something wrong with her. And that's always been a conflict for me because we also know from the stories of the Bible and from other faith traditions that we are all the children of God created in the divine image. And so for me, I never really rested easily with this idea that there's something wrong with our hearts and that Jesus had to die for us. That didn't seem like a loving God to me, and I knew that God was love. So when I came across Herb's story, it really helped me think of some other questions. For example, certainly the Romans who had Jesus executed like a criminal weren't participating in some big plan to forgive everybody from their sins. The actual life and teachings of Jesus were upsetting to the people in charge at that time. Jesus was teaching about loving everybody, even the Romans actually, and he was stirring up ways to nonviolently resist the bad things that were happening. Crowds of people were following him. He was talking about the kingdom of God being present right here and now. What happens if those who are on the margins of our society suddenly come into the middle and those are the people that God actually has such a beloved heart for. That was really upsetting to the people in charge. And ultimately, it's those teachings that got Jesus killed. We've seen that with other great leaders who are preaching about solving some of the big problems of the world. People like Martin Luther King Jr. and Gandhi. The systems that are in charge often don't like those messages. And so that's now I think about Jesus' death now the message that he was preaching about love and about treating everybody, especially those who our society tends to put on the outside as God's most treasured children, that was very upsetting. And so I think this is something that we can all talk about and just think of if we are thinking of Jesus as being here to show us how to live, to give us an example of God's love, how does that change the story of Easter for us? What does that mean about resurrection and ideas that maybe even though in the short term, the violent method seems stronger, crucifixion was the way that the Romans used to humiliate people who they saw as troublemakers. But ultimately, this story ends that love is more powerful, even if it seems that the violent way is at first winning. That's one of the reasons why I've always loved the Harry Potter stories is because ultimately the message is that love is the most powerful thing in the universe. I also have found the story of Moana to be an incredibly beautiful story of transformation and redemption that does not use violence. So um, maybe if you wanna have some homework watching Moana this Easter, could be a really fun one. Um, I have a little surprise. We are gonna call Herb right now and see if he has a thought for us. Let's see if this works. I'll turn it up. Hello? Why, hello, Herb. This is Deneen. Hi, Deneen, how are you? I am well. We are. Filming right now the third Holy Troublemakers story time, and I just finished reading your profile. Oh, excellent! And excellent. I was telling them that your um, oldest daughter Allie did your portrait too. That's correct. That's a really special connection. Yeah, she's a very talented artist. How are you and your family doing right now with COVID nineteen and sheltering at home? Well, we're we're. we're doing the best we can. Um, today, I actually uh, spent my day not sheltering at home. I actually uh, wore a mask and some gloves and went out grocery shopping for, for many of the elders that are either in our family or in our circle of friends. Uh, just some basic grocery shopping for them so that they, they don't have to leave their house, so that they can shelter in place and, and stay home. Thanks for doing that. Yeah, that's a really... Why am I not surprised that you're doing that? Thank you. <laughs> uh, it's not a big deal. Um, 
I love so much that your story is in this book um, for many reasons, but one of the biggest reasons is that when I started to have questions about the story I was going to tell my children about Easter and Jesus's life and death and all of those stories, I was deeply troubled by what I had grown up with. And you were one of the first people whose work helped me understand that there are other ways and have actually always been other ways. It's just not as well known. That's right. That's to, right. To talk about this. And I wondered if you had any, just a short thought for kids who are watching and who are going to be home this Easter and not in sure. church for, uh, what, what do you, how do you talk about Easter with, uh, the kids in your life right now? Yeah. Well, the Jesus story and, and specifically Easter, it really isn't about dying. I mean, I know the story includes Jesus' death, but it's much more about those things that have the power to, to overcome death, like like the golden rule, mm -hmm. you know, treating others the way we would like to be treated, or, or cooperation and sharing, sharing with, when you have more than what you need, mm -hmm. sharing with those who don't have enough, and, and, and things like loving one another, even our enemies, and, and living nonviolently, these are the things that the story tells us overcame death, mm. have the power to overcome death. They, 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 these are the things that, that reversed or mm. undid or overcame the interruption of, of Jesus' execution by a, a powerful few who, who were benefiting from an unjust society. And especially this year, I know... Um, you know, maybe some of the kids are, are watching or even overhearing some of the things that are on the news mm -hmm. or, or, or just aware of some of the things that are going on in our world right now. And it can be be pretty scary. And, mm -hmm. and if there's any hope, uh, our hope uh, right now is in living out these things that are that that are life giving, these life giving ways of of treating one another and pressing together and taking care of one another, mm -hmm. even in the face of things that quite honestly are pretty scary. Yeah. I love that. Even in the face of things that are scary, COVID-19 execution, yeah. execution and persecution by Romans or whatever oppressive system, uh, is in charge at the moment. There's, this is still about taking care of each other and ultimately that connection yeah. and that love is more powerful. That's that's the end yeah, of the story, if, ultimately. If the story teaches us anything, this is the time where we need love the most. We don't need to turn inward and become isolationists and taking care of only ourselves. We need to be uh, pressing together um, and, and taking care of one another. And, and that's, that's what overcomes death in the story, and that's what overcomes death, I believe, even in real life. Thank you so much for that, Herb. Hey, thanks for including me. I hope everyone has a happy Easter as much as they can. And, and uh, yeah, thank you so much for, for calling. Thank you. Much love to you and your family. Thank you. You too. Bye. Bye-bye. That was a special treat. I really love that that worked out. So that was a little bit on... Easter, even today in the midst of COVID-19 and some of the scary stuff going on from Herb Montgomery and how in the big picture, when we press together and love each other and take care of each other, that is ultimately what overcomes even the scariest things like death. So maybe a little bit of homework um, could be looking for signs of resurrection, of new life, of uh, ways people are coming together to offer things that maybe they wouldn't have before. I've seen so many wonderful examples of companies and people doing things that they might not have done before. And ultimately, how is that going to help us overcome this together and love more? I, uh, I had a little thought from my daughter, my oldest one, the same one I talked about earlier. Um, when she was three, that helped me realize that I needed to have a different story about Easter and Jesus' life and death. And I asked her what she thought the whole point of Easter was and what a nonviolent atonement was. And she wrote me a little thought. Um, it's a little, little blessing that we can leave with. She says that Jesus died to show us 
that he wasn't some warrior who was going to fight and kill. He was going to use nonviolence. He wasn't going to overthrow the Romans or any of those systems with violence. But he came back. This is the story of resurrection. He came back to show everyone that my love is for you. And she has that underlined. My love is for you. And it's stronger than death. Love wins. Jesus was the ultimate example of how love wins. So maybe we can write in our windows, love wins, or in chalk on a sidewalk near us. Um, in what ways are we seeing love winning right now? In your home, in your community, and in our world. And I think that's a great way that we can really live out the spirit of Easter and Herb's teachings today. I would love to hear your thoughts. As always, you can email me. You can go to our website, holytroublemakers.com and click contact, or you can just email support at watchfire.org and that will come right to me. Thank you so much. Much love this Easter, especially to you and yours. Bye now.